You're listening to podcasts from the Congressional Internet Caucus Academy. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Lorden, and I'm the executive director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Academy. Um, welcome to our monthly tech policy recess um, discussion series. Um, as you may notice on the slide here, we have the wrong date. Today is January, June 2, uh, 2022. And um, uh, I just wanted to uh, you know, thank you for joining us. We've been doing these monthly briefings for the Congressional Internet Caucus probably since 1996. So um, uh, thank you. Today's event uh, is called Europe's Digital Markets Act, DMA, competition perspectives from the European Commission and some perspectives from uh, folks in the US. Um, this, as all of our events are hosted um, by the Congressional Internet Caucus Academy, which is us, um, in conjunction with the Congressional Internet Caucus itself. And on the Congressional Internet Caucus uh, co-chairs um, on the Hill, our, our Senator Patrick Leahy and Senator John Thune on the Senate side, and Congresswoman Anna Eshoo and Congressman Michael McCall on the House side. So we thank them for um, co-hosting this event with us. Um, today, um, we're joined by uh, representatives from the European Commission, and we're thrilled to have them. Um, I've been doing this job for a long time, but before I joined this organization, I went to a Congressional Internet Caucus briefing in 1998 about the uh, 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 data directive in the European Commission. So um, it's been great that they show up and um, kind of explain what, what they're doing in Europe and how it intersects. And it's a really great learning opportunity. So I want to thank uh, the officials from the, the commission and the mission here uh, for helping us with this event. Um, so let me just really quickly introduce um, the speakers from the commission that are going to be speaking today. We have uh, Gerard DeGraff, who is the Director for Digital Transformation at the Director of Generate Communications Networks content and technology, often called um, DG Connect at the European Commission. We also have Inga Bernatz, um, Policy Director for the Director General, General um, for Competition, sometimes called D D DG Comp um, at the European Commission. And we have Michael Koenig, who's an advisor um, at the Director General um, DG Connect. So we're thrilled to have them. And we'll have some um, follow-up questions from Sumit Sharma, who's with um, Consumer Reports, and Ashley Baker from the Committee for Justice was supposed to be here today, but she got sick just a few um, hours ago and she won't be able to join us. But let me just um, start by going first. I know that um, Gerard de Graff um, from the commission from DG uh, Connect wants to make some just introductory remarks on, on where we are with the, the Digital Markets Act. Gerard? Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here also on behalf of my colleagues and, and welcome. Good morning to all of you uh, who are connecting from the US. I, I wanted to, to say just a few words as a kind of an opening, uh, setting a little bit of the scene. Um, and, and then my colleagues will, will take over and, and go into a bit more depth and of course leave enough uh, time for, for questions and answers because that's, that's really important. I wanted to say three things. I mean, the first thing is that obviously we zoom in today on the Digital Markets Act, which is a very important piece of legislation. I mean, there's a, a political agreement on that at the end of March. It will be formalized and, and then adopted and, and entered into force later this year. Uh, so it's, it's certainly a landmark piece of legislation. But I, I wanted to kind of just to, uh, if necessary, point out that we're doing a lot in the European Union to make sure that the EU is ready and, and leads on digital transformation. And that obviously is in the regulatory field. We have a single market that needs to work better in digital. We, we, we have still too much fragmentation, but we also are investing significantly in, in digital technology. So, I mean, I, I, I want to avoid the impression that the only thing that the European Union do, does is, is legislate. We, we, we do a lot of investment, also our member states, and of course, also the private sector in areas from chips, 5G, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, etc. So that's the first point I wanted to make. And maybe in the future, we could have another monthly, I mean, we, we have some time to discuss these other things that the EU is involved in. The second point I wanted to stress is that we are going to, of course, implement and enforce the legislation and including the Digital Markets Act in an even handed way. It does not matter where you are established as a company, where your headquarters is, what matters is kind of, are you active? in the European Union? Are you providing your service into the European Union? So any kind of concern about that somehow the European Union will single out some companies and I mean, it is unfounded uh, and, and actually in practice, we, we are quite confident that also for the Digital Markets Act and for the Digital Services Act, which is also a, a landmark piece of re regulation, there will be several 
uh, European companies and, 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 and companies from other uh, geographies uh, within uh, the scope. The last point I wanted to make is to stress that we've been working very closely with our uh, American colleagues uh, in the context of the Trade and Technology Council. The Trade and Technology Council, of course, um, uh, covers a, a very broad range of activities. It has really given momentum to the European uh, EU-US relationship. There's a lot going on. We had a, a meeting at the top political level two weeks ago in Paris. I think it was a very, very positive meeting. Also in this area, we have been working very closely on the DSA and the DMA. We are also very interested in what happens on the Hill. Some very interesting bills have been, been introduced. I, I think, in, in one word, the mood is constructive. This is not an area where the EU and, and the US are at loggerheads, where kind of there is a, a acrimony, etc. On the contrary, I think there is a shared problem analysis. Of course, we regulate in, in, in a way that maybe you would not regulate in the US. But at least we have a, a great deal of, of, of understanding and, and, and shared kind of uh, convergent views around these, uh, these, these issues. So with these three things, I just wanted to set a little bit the scene and then hand over to, uh, to Inge and to Michael for a, a bit more detail on the Digital Markets Act. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gerard. That's really a great context. Um, and, you know, with regard to um, uh, uh, Inge is going to maybe kind of, I'd ask Inge if she could lay out like what, you know, expand on what uh, Gerard said and why the, the European Commission and the European Union wanted to do the Digital Markets Act and, 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 and what was the purpose, what the rationale behind that. And just for the folks listening, um, Inga is from the Director General of Competition, a uh, different part of the commission. So this is a commission-wide initiative. So Inga, could you give us more context on why? Yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Tim, and good morning uh, to you all. I indeed can very neatly pick up on uh, where uh, Gerhard left it, because I think it is indeed important to emphasize that um, as EU, we want to lead on, on the digital uh, transformation. And, and that's a matter also of generating the necessary investments to make that happen. But of course, for such investments to happen, it's important also to have uh, fair market conditions, to have contestability into the market and opportunities for businesses uh, of all sizes, no matter where they are coming from. And it's precisely from that perspective of contestability, also from the perspective of, of fairness, that we saw some issues in digital markets. And, and, and that's very much the background to the Digital Markets Act and the reason why we tabled it. In DG Competition, we've been having now more than 20 years of experience and very actively enforcing also the antitrust rules against uh, digital companies and against that type of behavior, which was having exclusionary um, consequences. And what we've seen throughout these 20 years, throughout these cases, is that some patterns of behavior really occur. You see some behavior coming back, which we have, have looked into in detail and demonstrated how they have negative effects and how efficiencies do not outweigh those. And they really come in different uh, shades sometimes, but there are underlying patterns, whether that's about tying behavior, about self-preferencing behavior, about um, online demediation platforms, um, abusing double roles that they play to create exclusionary effects. It's not only these antitrust cases, these enforcement cases, it's also uh, sector inquiries that we have been doing, um, expert reports that we've been commissioning um, from Gerard's uh, department's perspective, an observatory that has been looking into detail in markets and market trends and which have been flagging the same issues. And so the question came to the fore, like, are these antitrust instruments the best suited to deal with these issues? And we quite quickly saw that that was not the case for two reasons. First of all, in digital, we are dealing with fast evolving markets. And often by the time you get to do your antitrust um, and decisions, the markets had tipped already. So there was an issue of speed of intervention um, in this case. On the other side, there's a matter of, of simply efficiency then of, of enforcement, whether it's the most efficient way forward from an enforcement perspective to go after every case and look afresh each time into establishing uh, dominance, into analyzing effects and, and efficiency. And what I wanted to highlight very much um, to you today as well is that there's actually a quite common um, 
approach that we have followed in the EU over the past decades, that when we see some systemic flaws in, in uh, sectors, which are best tackled in a systemic manner, that then relying and basing ourselves on our antitrust uh, knowledge, we go towards uh, different instruments which at work much more ex ante. That's something that we've done extensively in telecoms, if you think about uh, regulation of roaming uh, rates, for example, in the energy sector, uh, what we've done in, in banking and what we have now also been doing uh, when it comes to the digital market sector. So there are clear enforcement uh, um, advantages to that approach uh, from our perspective, but I believe that there are also clear advantages to the businesses who might be in scope of the digital market sector. Uh, and one dimension has been highlighted already by Gerhard is that our legislation, the Digital Markets Act, also has a harmonizing effect. It makes sure that there is a common set of regulatory rules across the EU, uh, rather than companies having to deal with different sets of rules in our various uh, member states. And secondly, it also provides more legal certainty to the businesses, because rather than the principle-based antitrust uh, enforcement, the DMA contains quite specific um, obligations and, and prohibitions that I think give the companies concerned much more clarity about what is expected. Um, there are some areas where we might have to fine tune that through a regulatory dialogue and Michael will comment on that later. But I think overall, if you compare the precision of the DMA towards a more principle based approach in, in competition, I think it's um, obvious to state that the Digital Markets Act gives uh, more, more precision. Final point maybe from my side um, is to highlight the scope of the Digital Markets Act. It's a piece of asymmetrical regulation. It only has uh, a limited um, number of uh, undertakings in scope that meet thresholds which are very highly set and that distinguish it from other pieces of legislation like the Digital Services Act, uh, for example, that Gerard uh, uh, refers to. It distinguishes also from antitrust rules which are generically um, applicable. So the Digital Markets Act only uh, zooms in on the largest players on the European market. It zooms in only on specific core platform services, which we believe have features um, that are prone to give rise to these issues of contestability and fairness that I, I described. And we zoom in only on a limited number of behaviors for which we feel that there is sufficient evidence and the legislator has confirmed that based on the evidence that, that we have produced that those are problematic um, behavior. Where there is behavior going beyond what is forbidden by the DMA, we will still do the more refined case-by-case -case analysis on the antitrust to see whether that's uh, something that requires action. So that's where we've been coming from and the general gist on, on the DMA and the purposes, uh, objectives that it tries to achieve. Um, and Michael can comment um, a bit more maybe also using the slides that we have been sending in terms of background information on, on the mechanics of the Digital Markets Act. Well, that's, that's a great overview on the kind of why and, and, and from Gerard and from Inga. So now I guess we go to how, um, which is this is a complicated piece of legislation it's been worked on for quite a while, a lot of negotiation among the, the stakeholders in Europe. Um, I'd ask Michael who, you know, Inga is with DG Comp, uh, let's go back to DG Connect with Michael Koenig and kind of explain a little bit of the, why, the how does this work. Yes, thank you very much, Tim, and uh, also hello from my side to, to everyone, and great to have the opportunity to address this audience today. Um, so I will focus a bit on the, um, the mechanics of the Digital Markets Act, um, and uh, if you can have the next slide, please um, run through the, the main chapters um, and uh, I'd like to, to focus very much on, on the, the, the elements that have been subject also to discussion and changes um, in the legislative process um, compared to the individual proposal that the Commission had uh, put on, uh, on the table. So on the next slide, um, directly linking to uh, what Inge said about the targeted nature uh, of the, the DMA, um, its, its scope really starts with a, a enumerative list of services uh, which are in scope um, and um, which show these specific features that we have in the platform industries um, and here in the process two services the two at the end have been added uh, namely web browsers and virtual assistants also with a view of future 
uh, proofing of the DMA and saying, well, these are uh, tools and services which uh, gains similar importance over time um, and, uh, and can be compared to all the other services that we already um, had proposed to be in scope at the beginning. Next slide, please. Now, once uh, we start from these services, then uh, the question is, what is a gatekeeper? Where um, the, um, the DMA works with general criteria, um, a significant impact on the, in, on the EU market. Um, service has to be an important gateway, and uh, this uh, position has to be um, entrenched, meaning durable enough and not uh, uh, just a, a one-day situation. And then um, this uh, bringing companies in scope really requires an individual designation decision of the commission. So this is really uh, to give legal certainty for the companies um, to know exactly uh, whether they are in scope and which services will be captured. And, um, and this can be done via two ways. On the one hand, what we call the quantitative designation based on certain numerical thresholds that create a presumption that um, the requirements are met. Um, and those are related to, uh, to turnover figures or, or market capitalization, but also very much to user numbers to uh, um, inform the gateway uh, question and adjust the duration of the, of the, um, of the position. Now, it's important to stress um, that there are, is flexibility in both ways. Namely, um, the, uh, in case there, the, the thresholds are met, the company can still argue, can rebut the presumption and can still argue these figures are not really telling about my position and therefore um, uh, it should not be designated as a gatekeeper. And on the other hand, there's also a possibility for the commission to uh, designate on a qualitative basis companies that do not meet the thresholds, but where it nevertheless believes that these uh, more general criteria are fulfilled um, and where uh, the user numbers are, again, not, not uh, telling enough to make this assessment. Next slide, please. So this just, again, uh, repeats the possibility of the rebuttal that there is a flexibility in the system. So there is no automatism that once you meet the thresholds, immediately uh, the company is in scope and there is a, a um, and the obligations apply but at the same time the presumption is a strong one so there have to be really uh, substantiated and convincing arguments to um, rebut this presumption uh, from the threshold next slide please um, now once the company is in scope the obligations that we have in the dma apply directly. So this is the general philosophy and the distinguishing factor also, if you want two, two other tools in this area, is that these are precise obligations that are <coughs> applicable directly once a company is in scope. And uh, they can you know, be clustered according to certain areas and we don't have time to enter into all of them, you know, which are data related ones, things related to timing, those around the mobile ecosystem, and, uh, and, and many more. Um, maybe just to highlight a few changes that have been made in the negotiations, I will also just pick a few. Um, there was uh, a lot of uh, interest in, in, uh, in the mobile ecosystems and opening up the mobile ecosystems with more choice for users. Uh, so the uh, so introduced were obligations for, for choice screens for some of the key services like virtual assistants, search engines, or browsers on operating systems, which I think is a key element that brought, was brought in. Um, there is uh, also interoperability as such has been uh, strengthened in both directions. If you want vertically between uh, sort of operating systems and then connected devices, IoT devices, based on work that we did in the IoT area and the sector inquiry, um, but also when it comes to a horizontal interoperability between um, messenger services in particular, although they come with a number of safeguards to uh, ensure um, user security to be fully preserved. Um, and then also when it comes to access conditions to certain services where uh, beyond app stores, also search engine and social networks now have to uh, apply such 
trend uh, conditions, published general conditions, but also include dispute resolution mechanisms um, to, uh, to resolve detailed questions around them. Next slide, please. Now, um, I, I stress very much that the obligations are directly applicable. Um, but we also identified that a set of these obligations um, can profit from further specification. Um, now, it's again important to stress that this is specification about the how. It's not about whether these obligations shall apply. Um, but on some of them in particular, if you talk about intermobility, if you talk about access to data, here several technical questions can arise on how exactly to do it. And here there is the possibility for either the Commission on its own to start such a specification uh, discussion or upon the request of a gatekeeper to, um, to engage in this and at the end of the process um, issue a, a binding decision which specifies further how in practice a concrete obligation has to be applied. Um, now there is uh, for the degree of, of uh, uh, discretion by the Commission, or uh, also to avoid the bad faith use of this uh, dialogue, if you want to, uh, to call it. Um, but uh, our commitment is clear to say, well, if there is a good faith uh, um, engagement on both sides, we are ready to engage in this uh, dialogue process. Good faith means that it always is on the gatekeeper to make a first attempt, a good faith attempt, to comply, and then we can uh, look at it and further specify on it. Um, now, of course, also there has been introduced possibilities to reopen these type of decisions in case they, they did not uh, lead to the desired outcomes. Next uh, slide, please. Um, then um, there's also the possibility of market investigations, so where the Commission more in depth looks into, into certain questions. One is the qualitative designation I already mentioned. Um, the other one are cases of systemic non-compliance, which opens up possibilities to impose further remedies and further solutions. And then also a very important element to ensure the future proofing. Um, in particular, the Commission is identifying new practices, which are very close to the ones that uh, we already have, but where new developments uh, require certain amendments to still achieve the objectives of these obligations, then there is a very specified possibility for uh, the Commission to uh, expand or adapt the obligations to such uh, technical or business developments. Um, now there's also an a, a, a enforcement toolbox. We have an effective investigation toolbox which but at the same time also guarantees the rights to be heard of all the affected companies um, because it may lead to sanctions for breaches of any of the obligations um, on the one hand leading to fines which can go up to 10% of the worldwide turnover and 20% uh, in case of, uh, of repeated infringements and in case of a systemic, systematic non-compliance um, uh, there is also the possibility to uh, open up uh, uh, the toolbox for further remedies to address uh, non-compliance, including behavioral and structural solutions. Uh, and this also includes a possible time-limited and targeted ban on acquisitions. But it is very important to stress that all these measures are under a clear requirement of proportionality, that other means uh, uh, that are less intrusive cannot achieve the same uh, outcome and therefore will be very carefully uh, used by the Commission, obviously. Um, last but not least, to stress that the Commission will indeed be the sole enforcer of the DMA to reap the advantages that Inge started to say at the beginning, that we have a horizontal rule book for the whole EU, but also the implementation and interpretation of this rule book is consistent because it's exclusively the Commission that is uh, enforcing and interpreting it with some help in terms of pre-investigations at national level, but the ultimate uh, um, decision is at the Commission and also the uh, consistency with competition law enforcement at national level uh, is ensured with uh, a cooperation mechanism that will make sure that this is uh, not leading to, a, to a inconsistent outcomes for companies uh, that operate in the EU. I think that is essentially the last slide. Um, just a few words on, uh, on the next step. So when is the DMA coming into force? 
Um, it will be formally adopted in, in September, October of this year, and then uh, applies with a six months uh, delay, uh, meaning March and April, which starts first with the obligation to notify for gatekeepers within two months. Um, and then after the designation, the obligations really kick in uh, six months after the designation decision. So this allows you also to see a bit. There's a leeway, and we are in full implementation and preparation mode now. Um, but I'm very happy to uh, answer any further questions around the content and this run-up of the process. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. That was a that was a great detailed um, uh, discussion about how this all works and, and the next steps and when it goes into effect. Um, I think we're going to do some just a little bit of Q and A for right now uh, before we go to the next step um, in the program. Um, if you have any questions for um, Gerard, Inga, and Michael, uh, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, as far as the first question goes, um, the question is like, um, is this detailed uh, PowerPoint available? And we're going to work on, see if we can get a public version of it after the event. So please stay tuned for that. I have another question from uh, Phil Berenbrock, um, who is the uh, counsel on the House Judiciary Antitrust Subcommittee um, for the speakers. This is from Phil. Can you explain how you believe the DMA will affect innovation, dynamism, and small business participation in digital markets? And how do you respond to claims by large internet platforms that the DMA will harm innovation in the EU? So I guess that's for Inga, Gerard, uh, Michael. I can say a few. I mean, we, I think there is a, a truth is that whenever you have more competition, you see more dynamism, you see more innovation. And the DMA is a pro-competition instrument. Uh, I mean, we are seeing some practices in the European Union that diminish quite significantly the, the contestability of the market. And, and if you remove those practices, you would see opportunities and scope for, for much greater competition. It is also an asymmetrical instrument, uh, so it, it doesn't um, affect in any way. It doesn't impose any obligations on small businesses. On the contrary, small businesses will have new opportunities. They will benefit from fairer treatment. So th this argument, which of course, if you are a platform, probably big tech, you when you use any argument to try to um, point out that this is this is not welcome. Uh, but but the argument that this somehow will uh, be, uh, I mean, reducing innovation and, and, and competitiveness in the European Union is uh, is completely, as the French would say, a côté de la plaque, so completely kind of uh, untrue. Um, maybe if I may just add on that, uh, as, as Gerard said, indeed, we firmly believe that it's competitive markets, which ensure then that uh, it's the most innovative uh, company bringing the best service at the best conditions that, that gains a market share. And that's what contestability is about, to make sure that these uh, chances uh, are indeed preserved um, for innovation by all companies, uh, not only the incumbents, but also new entrants. And I think we've been careful in designing the Digital Markets Act to make sure that we um, keep open for innovation, both incentives on the platforms, on the largest digital players, also to compete amongst each other and enter into markets uh, which um, Another platform uh, might already have an uh, established uh, uh, position, but also to allow for new entrants to come into the market. So both the, the intra-platform competition and the within-platform competition um, has, has clearly been kept in mind with the perspective of stimulating uh, innovation uh, from all sides. Okay, um, I have another question from uh, Mark McCarthy at, at Georgetown University. Um, Mark is wondering if um, XR is covered, and I believe XR is a combination of AR, VR, uh, virtual technologies. Michael? Michael? Okay. <clears throat> if you want to, um, I think, um, first of all, we, we, we have to be clear that the um, the definition of the different services is in, in to a large extent um, technology neutral. Uh, so we're using terms like on, online intermediation service, uh, you know, a service which brings, if you want, supply and demand together on a platform. And no matter how this actually is done technically, uh, the same uh, applies to, if you want, operating systems where again we don't make a distance whether this is an operating system on a device or on a, on a mobile phone or on a uh, on a smart tv or in a car uh, 
so I think we, we try to work as much as possible with notions which are more about the service and what a certain service does rather than the technology that it uses to do so. Uh, and I think the, the virtual assistants is also a good example. I mean, I think initially there was a discussion, let's, let's include voice assistants, but it was already felt that um, this is a technological straitjacket which is not compatible with this approach of, of really being technology neutral. So how the interaction with such an assistant is actually designed, so be it with words, with gestures, by support of more uh, virtual technology, um, that's in that sense not matter. Um, but it's, on the other hand, you know, there's no specific virtual, you know, reality or, or other application which is specifically targeted. Um, but uh, as I said, we believe that with the notions that we have in, in, in shaping which services should be in scope, we are able to, to capture also technological developments that, that may then involve different technologies. Th thanks. Thanks. That's that's interesting. Technology neutral. Um, let me just go to the next portion of the program. We wanted to have different perspectives from the U.S. because there's a lot of legislation moving through the United States um, Congress, and we wanted to have some perspectives on kind of how this, how we could translate what's happening with the Digital Markets Act in Europe and what it, what the companion pieces of legislation on the Hill look like. So we asked um, Sumit Sharma from Consumer Reports and Ashley Baker from the Committee for Justice to join us to just provide some perspective and, and feedback on, on this presentation. Um, Ashley apparently just um, ha was feeling ill this morning and just emailed us that she her voice was um, uh, out and so she won't be joining us, but Sumit is with us. And Sumit, could you provide some perspectives on this? So uh, thanks, uh, <clears throat> thanks, Tim, and thanks uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to uh, speak with this audience. Uh, so in terms of, I think I'm speaking to a US audience, uh, most of them are probably aware of the, of the two bills which uh, do similar things to the DMA. One is the American Innovation and Choice Online Act, S2992, and the other is the Open App Markets Act, S2710. And I think I would uh, agree with uh, Gerard here that we're not at uh, loggerheads here when it comes to some of these uh, rules. Uh, you know, both these bills passed with the overwhelming bipartisan support in the Senate Judiciary Committee. And I know the House versions as well of, of, of these bills. Uh, you know, there, there was a letter of support by the DOJ for the bills. And we you know the executive office is also supportive. So I think there is momentum here in the US as well to, to have similar rules to the DMA. Uh, and that's, those, are, those are the two things there. Uh, the next, I would like to say there are similarities in how these, the DMA and the American Innovation Choice Online Act defines who's covered, right? We have covered platforms here as well. And uh, uh, it's based on a similar criteria, focusing on companies who operate in the US, based on the number of users in the US, uh, which are online services which reflects that, you know, these are companies which have an established base with network effects, which is which is self-reinforcing. Um, then the second bit is that it, we have a similar threshold, uh, you know, a net sales or uh, market capitalization threshold, which often reflects the fact that these companies operate across ecosystems, you know, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons. It, it captures the fact that they can leverage across different markets. And then finally, uh, a market power type test in the US legislation is this criteria of critical trading partner. So for uh, online platform to be a covered platform, it also needs to be critical trading partner. I think this reflects the fact that in many cases, the largest, the giant, these giant online platforms effectively control the marketplaces that they operate in, the set terms and conditions for these marketplaces. And so it's a, it's a combination of all these three things, which are captured, I think, in both the DMA and the US version of these bills, which reflect these very complex sources of market power. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and then cover uh, these uh, different companies. Um, I, I guess my job is not really going into detail of, uh, of, of, the, of the American bills, but I'm happy to do that later offline, get in touch with me. Uh, I'll just say a few words about the, uh, the implementation of these bills, I think. So I think the commission uh, has a lot of resources and it's, I've just heard the commission is going to take the lead here with the NRAs 
Uh, you know, in the U.S., it's going to be the FTC, the DOJ, uh, supported by state AGs. We definitely will need much, a lot more resources uh, to better resource these, equip these agencies to implement something like this if it becomes if, if it becomes law. And uh, I think the DMA already has a lot of detail in it about what's covered, what's not covered in some cases. And we're still and in and, and the bill in the US foresees that the FTC, FTC and DOJ will jointly come up with detailed guidelines in the year following the passage of the bill if it becomes law. And during that year, you know, the, the, the covered platforms and the DOJ can have a have a dialogue to come up with similar uh you know with, with rules that are uh uh, appropriate, more detailed rules, which are appropriate. Uh, so, you know, we have a similar uh, waiting period here before uh, anything takes effect. Uh, there's some, fine, just one final point, if I may, there are some differences in the details of what the DMA does and what the American Innovation Choice Online Act does. For example, uh, you know, messaging services are not explicitly covered here uh, in, in, in the act in the US. Uh, Pre-installation is, is not banned. It's just the ability is, is the ability to give users to easily change defaults. So I understand the DMA actually says that you can't pre-install some services. That's not the case here with the US bill. And uh, finally, I guess there are some sort of business line restrictions in the in the DMA when it comes to data use, right? You have this concept of data silo, et cetera, uh, which is again, not there in, uh, in, in, in the US uh, bill. So I think there are some differences in approach and another interesting challenge will be coordination on some of these remedies when they're uh, you know, implemented kind of tools. So thank you. Thank you, Sumit. That, that's that's great perspective. Um, and again, uh, I apologize. We just found out this morning that Ashley was was feeling a little bit under the weather, didn't have the voice to speak. So um, I don't want to speak for her. I'd like to be able to share her perspective, but I am not prepared to do that. And I apologize. We have a few more questions and I want to see if we can get to them. Uh, one is from Ke Kelly Emmerich, who I believe is probably with me at that 1998 um, Congressional Internet Caucus EU Data Directive Briefing on the Hill. Um, uh, she, my, uh, Kelly asks um, that Michael had mentioned that IoT devices uh, in the context of vertical interoperability. Can you can you expand on this point and explain where IoT will be included under the new regulation? Yes, many thanks uh, for, for the question and, and very happy to clarify. So um, we um, this is based on on at least the sector inquiry that you know uh, in, in this competition was run around IoT devices where um, some of the issues that we already addressed to a certain extent in the DMA proposal have been uh, underlined and therefore this was strengthened. And um, what is meant here is that um, in this IoT area, it's typically in relation to, to operating system of, of devices where in order to interact, um, there needs to be, you know, a connection and, in, and interoperability, um, which both uh, relates to, to software, but also hardware features. So if uh, devices like, uh, you know, wearables or, you know, smart home devices wanted to connect with uh, certain uh, mobile devices, the smartphones, etc., I mean, they, uh, under the DMA, have to have uh, the same access to the same technological features and, and performance of the operating system and this device as the, um, the, the gatekeeper offers to its own services, to its own IoT and variable and connected uh, services. Yeah. So again, this is, if you want a, a, a kind of a non-discrimination rule in the sense that um, it, it imposes a sort of an equal treatment of, of third party um, providers of such connected devices compared to such connective devices that are offered uh, by the um, by the gatekeeper in connection with its operating system and mobile uh, system as well. And I think this relates directly to the question on innovation. It is precisely to allow you know alternative providers of such uh, such devices to to profit from uh, from uh, opportunities in, in this context. Thank thank you, Michael. That's great. Let me let me ask you another, let me ask another question that that's come up with the question and answer. Um, this is from um, Kay Javelli from, from actually Europe. Um, are the capacity constraints of 80 employees still envisaged for the designation specification process? If so, has there been any thinking regarding whether to designate all core platform services from a gatekeeper from the start, or perhaps focus on the most significant platform services? And she gives an example of like Google search service, but maybe not Microsoft's search service. 
Yeah, maybe I can take um, this one. Of course, from from the Commission's perspective, we'll we'll staff um, the enforcement of the Digital Markets Act as as needed. Um, but um, that's also the reason why, when it comes to the designation, that the question is about specifically. Um, we, we believe that the criteria which are set out in the Digital Markets Act will not necessarily require very detailed investigations to come to the designation decision in itself. That's also why we believe the 45 working days uh, deadline to do so is, um, is, is manageable. That's, of course, to say for those core platform services that meet the, the thresholds and where there is not a credible rebuttal that is handed in. But again, there the mechanics, as Michael explained, it, are such that uh, if there are more doubtful cases, that there is also a longer time period, and which will then also mean that that designation will happen uh, later. A point that I'd like to make with regard to, to the resources and those 80 people which have been uh, uh, foreseen uh, right now as an indication of how many people would be there to enforce the DMA, that concerns, of course, the public enforcement by the Commission. But it's important to underline that this is a piece of legislation which in Europe also gives direct rights to uh, private undertakings. To the extent that there are obligations on the gatekeepers towards private undertakings, those private undertakings can also enforce those rights directly in the courts and tribunals of our member states. If there is, for example, a most favored nation clause, which is um, um, prohibited by the DMA, then a national court can also uh, declare such a clause uh, void. And there can also be injunction decisions which are uh, sought for through private enforcement uh, in those uh, courts and tribunals. So I think it's important to think about the double angle um, of, of public enforcement that will, of course, we think be, be the key enforcement angle but to also be aware that there will be private enforcement around the Digital Markets Act across Europe as well. Great, great. Thank you for answering that. I, would, I have a follow-up question um, about uh, gatekeepers from Bob Cohen. Um, how are you going to select gatekeepers? But for instance, would a US CSP be able to be a gatekeeper if it had had ties with a European entity like France Telecom? Well, maybe to, to, to clarify first, we, we are not going to select gatekeepers. I mean, the gatekeepers are under an obligation to give us information uh, through the reporting initially by means of which they can be designated as, as, as gatekeepers. So the initiative has to be lies squarely with the, with the, the would-be or, or the likely gatekeepers. And so they will have to inform us what on the basis of the, the information that they have which of their services are core platform services and, and meet the, the requirements, also the numer numerical requirements of, for, for, for being designated as a, as a gatekeeper. I mean, what we would, of course, expect is that particularly big platforms would identify core platform services where they believe that they are a gatekeeper. They might also argue that in some cases, even though the core platform service is a service that they provide. They might consider that they do not meet, say, for example, the numerical criteria. And then, I mean, obviously, the Commission will look very carefully into, into this and, and, and take all, all of this into account with, with, uh, during the designation uh, uh, process. But the important thing is we, we do not select, we, we designate, uh, but on the basis of the information that the gatekeeper will make available, um, say, in, in a very early stage of, of the entry into force. The, the point about, I mean, as I said earlier, it doesn't really matter where you are headquartered, what country you are from, what is your ownership structure. Uh, as long as you provide services, core platform services into the European Union and you meet the criteria uh, set out in the Digital Markets Act, I mean, you, 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 you can and you will likely be designated. And, and so if like Amazon is co-owned by France Telecom for like 50%, Obviously, Amazon Marketplace, with with kind of co-owned by France Telecom, will be designated as a as a core platform service, and therefore will have to comply with the obligations in the in the DMA. So ownership doesn't doesn't matter. You have to kind of be active. You have to provide your services within the European Union, and then uh, meet uh, I mean, meet the criteria. So ownership is is irrelevant. Thank thank you, Gerard. Um, I'm getting so many questions, and also getting questions from emails. Um, I, there's one question. Um, I think you know maybe Sumit can weigh in on this one um, and follow up with um, Inga. Uh, Inga had mentioned uh, that 
the one of the things that this legislation does and the regulation does is is give the commission the speed to which to bring cases and address market competition concerns like a, that if much much faster um than than it normally would and we we know that sometimes antitrust um in the united states can move at a glacial pace um Sumit, do you think that any of the legislation on the Hill would increase the speed and the rapidity with which um, the government can address competitive concerns? Is that part of what the package of, of different bills on the Hill uh, seeks to do? Yes, I think that's, that's, that's definitely the idea. And uh, it's the speed, it's the fact that this can be a pro-competitive intervention, which actually allows others to enter and compete as opposed to coming in after the fact where potential competition has already gone away, uh, you know. Uh, and so, yeah, yes, I, I would agree with that. And then I, I have, if you, I know it's getting late in Europe, I just have one last question um, from Hill staff. Um, I think they're asking, in the US, um, large, large online platforms claim that the legislation, like the DMA here in the United States, um, would harm privacy and cybersecurity. So we hear that a lot. Um, or that it would destroy products like the iPhone and other products that are put out by large platforms. Did They're asking if the platforms make these claims to the European Commission, and how did the European Commission respond to those concerns? So I'd throw that up to Inga, Michael, or Gerard. Yeah, of course, when, when it comes to data protection, we have in, in the EU quite um, um, demanding legislation as well uh, around privacy and data protection. And the Digital Markets Act makes that clear that, of course, compliance with the Digital Markets Act must be done in a manner which is also compliant with those data protection uh, uh, rules. Um, on the, the cybersecurity issues, those are indeed um, arguments which have been made um, in, in the process of the design and, and the negotiation of the Digital Markets Act. And the DMA foresees possibilities, of course, to, to, to indicate uh, why certain features um, are, are necessary in order to preserve uh, the cyber um, security of, of, of the user. But I think there is a fundamental underlying uh, thought that it's, it's really about enabling the consumer to make sure that it, it takes the necessary um, um, uh, protection and, and for public authorities there to play their role and that it's not for the platforms to make those decisions about what type of risks is uh, acceptable on behalf of the consumer. So the logic in the DMA is very much about enabling uh, the consumer to, to make choices also when it comes to, to security. And of course, it is it's possible for the, for the platforms to protect the, the integrity and the security of their own operating systems, for example. So there are uh, safeguards in the Digital Market Act that, that allow for those. Well, um, I, I really appreciate. It. I, I know we um, we asked uh, more of you, more of your time, and late in the uh, in the evening um, in Brussels. I just want to thank um, uh, the European Commission and the delegation here in the United States for working with us and Sumit and Ashley, of course, uh, for participating in this. Hopefully, we can ask you all back. Uh, maybe as the Digital Services Act, you know, matures, and maybe we can have a, a look at that when that's uh, more finalized. But uh, Inga, Gerard, Michael, um, thank you so much for participating. We really appreciate this. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. All right. Thank thanks, you. everybody. Bye. -bye.